Welcome, my name is Willy and today I'm going to talk about solving dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models using a k-order perturbation approximation and with a particular focus what and how Dynair does this. So in this talk I'm assuming that you're familiar with a first order approximation and also how Dynair performs this um, and in this talk I'm going to talk about the theory behind the k-order perturbation techniques uh, the different representations that you can set it up with either with tensors or matrix representations and the underlying algorithms that are useful for performing such an app approximation of the policy function. So let me briefly recap the general model framework that we work with. That is we have this formula and let me go through the individual items here very briefly. So first of all we are typically concerned with discrete time models okay so typically the natural numbers or the whole numbers um, we have a vector a number n of endogenous variables those are the variables that you declare in the var block then we have a vector of exogenous variables the number is n u and those are the variables that you declare in var x in the var exo block and then we have that those exogenous variables in a stochastic context are at least white noise distributed. Actually, in Dynair, they're normally distributed with a zero mean and a contemporaneous covariance matrix of sigma u. This is what you declare in the shocks block. And then there are parameters, theta, the number is n theta, and those are the parameters of your model. Those are the parameters that you declare in the parameters block. And finally, your model equations, and here I'm denoting those with f. You have n variables, so you also need n model equations declared in the model block. To sum up, f is parameterized, your model is parameterized with the parameters theta. It is a continuous nonlinear function, um, and this constitutes a DSG model. Now, what about the expectation operator in front of this equation? So here we have to think about the information set and what we typically assume is a so-called filtration. That, uh, that means that previous information is in my current information set. Okay, so uh, in more, more concretely for, for us, this way of writing this down is basically the conditional expectation operator given a certain information set and what is in my information set? Um, well, it includes the model equations f, the value of the parameters theta, the value of the current state, yt minus one of the economy. Also the agents observe, they know the value of current exogenous variables and they know the distribution, which is invariant of future exogenous variables. They do not know the value of ut plus one, ut plus two, but they form expectations on that and they know the invariant distribution, meaning they also know the covariance matrix. So this is in my information set, um, the model equations, the parameters, the current state, current shocks, and the distribution of future, future shocks. And typically, instead of writing this expectation conditional on this filtration set, we typically just use shorthand notation expectation and we index the period at which we form expectations with a t or t minus one or t plus one. Okay, so Dynair's model framework shorthand, this is what we typically would write in a paper is uh, written like this. But let me be a bit more precise. Um, I have to talk about, about typology and ordering of variables. So first of all, we've seen that yt denotes a vector of all endogenous variables, so the number n, I have n endogenous variables in my model. Now, not all variables are the same, and particularly we have many variables, most variables for many models, that are static. They only appear at t, but not at t minus 1 and not at t plus 1. Um, then I have very important variables that actually drive the dynamics of the model, so-called predetermined variables. They appear at t minus one, but not very importantly at t plus one, and they might possibly also occur at t, but they don't have to. Okay, so the important distinction is they appear at t minus one, not at t plus one. 
And the other way around, those are what we call the forward-looking variables. They appear at t plus 1, but not at t minus 1, possibly also at t, but this is not necessary. And the last group of variables are the so-called mixed variables. They appear both at t minus 1 and t plus 1, possibly also at t, but they don't have to. Okay, so any variable that you will include in the model will belong to one of those four groups. And now we have two very important types of variables. I'm denoting them with a star and a double star. So yt star are the predetermined and the mixed variables. And their number is what we use in Dynair, ns pred. Okay, and those is what we call the state variables. They drive the dynamics of your model. The double star variables are the so-called jumper variables the mixed and forward-looking ones. Okay, to make this distinction is actually important for the perturbation approach. So remember, the star variables are the predetermined and mixed, called state variables. The double star variables are the mixed and forward variables, called jumper variables. Under the hood, Dynair has two ways to order the variables. And the first ordering, the so-called declaration ordering, is what you declare in your mode file. So if you declared yci, so the variable y will be ordered first, then comes c, then comes i. This is the so-called declaration order as you chose to define, to declare um, in, you, in the var block of a mode file. Then we are actually doing a transformation of this ordering according to the groups that we have. Okay, and this is what we then call the decision rule ordering, the so-called DR ordering. And we use this for perturbation to quickly access groups of variables because the underlying problem changes for those groups of variables. And the decision rule ordering is that we order static variables first, then we have the predetermined, then we have the mixed variables, and then the forward-looking ones. And remember our star, we have the state variables, so the predetermined and mixed, we order them in this way. And the double star um, here, the mixed variables come first and then the forward looking ones. Okay, and so very importantly, in the star and double star, some variables might belong to both vectors here. Okay, so this is the DR ordering. So in a sense, the actual model framework that we work with in Dynair is this one okay so we have all endogenous variables at t we have state variables at t minus one and we have jumper variables at t plus one and we have shocks and the distribution of shocks of course and dynair is or dynair's preprocessors actually able to transform any model that you put into a mode file into exactly this framework with only one lead and one leg okay so so we create under the hood auxiliary variables that uh, do a transformation of variables such that at the end you have a model with only where all variables only appear with either one lead, one leg, or at current period. So let me give you the ingredients that we need for a perturbation approximation. The first ingredient that we need is the so-called perturbation parameter. And the idea here is to scale the exogenous variables by a number, by a positive number, uh, sigma, and introduce auxiliary exogenous variables, eta, and those eta have the same uh, white noise properties of u. Okay, so uh, they have the same moments, but those moments are scaled with this sigma parameter. And since we're going to talk about k-order perturbation, we need a notation for k order product moments and here i'm using the chronica product so this will give you a vector with a very specific ordering of um, the underlying um, the underlying ethers okay so the first first moment will be sigma raised to uh, in parentheses one the second moments will be sigma raised to in parentheses two the third moments parentheses three etc okay so obviously there is a one-to-one -one connection between the product moments of u and the product moments of this eta, and we scale this by the sigma matrix. So this is the um, connection. 
And the sigma is called the perturbation parameter because I'm using this to kill stochastics in my model or to switch them on. Okay, so I can work very easily with the non-stochastic version of my model by simply setting the sigma parameter to zero. And this is then what we call working with the static model. And whenever this sigma parameter is larger than zero, I'm working with the dynamic model and with the stochastic model. And the sigma parameter really scales the uncertainty because if I, because for very large sigmas, the uncertainty measured by, for instance, the covariance matrix of your shocks um, is large. If the sigma is extremely small, then the uncertainty, again, measured by the covariance matrix in your model is very um, small as well. Now in Dynair, we assume that the error terms u or the, the exogenous variables u are normally distributed. So everything is governed basically by this covariance matrix. But, but the perturbation approach is more general. So we can also ha have a look at higher order moments that are different or that are independent of those uh, of that covariance matrix. But for the normal distribution, everything is basically based on the covariance matrix because we assume zero mean shocks. Now the second ingredient is a definition of what a dynamic solution to my model, to my stochastic model looks like. And we do so by introducing the concept of a policy function or a decision rule. Um, and this is, uh, the idea is to find an invariant mapping. So it doesn't matter if I'm in period T or in T plus five or in T plus 10 or in T minus five. I would like to find a mapping between the values for all the endogenous variables now at T given previous state variables and the current observed shocks. And this mapping, we call this the G function here. Okay, so this is the actual policy function. So given this, in any period of time, the state of the economy, Y star T minus one, the currently observed shocks and the uncertainty in my model, this function maps this into the decisions of agents and therefore also the values for all the endogenous variables in period of time T. And I can iterate this forward to get the values for the variables at T plus one, T plus two, etc., etc. And it also doesn't matter where I start. And this G function is called policy function or decision rule or transition function. And typically this G function is unknown and not only typically, but almost always, okay? There are like two or three cases where we can compute this G function analytically, but in all other cases, we need to find an approximation of this function. So the mathematical underlying problem is actually to, to solve a functional equation, which is a very hard thing to do. Now the third ingredient is the implicit function theorem. And the idea is that my dynamic model equations implicitly define my policy function. So the idea is that, what do I know? I do know my model equations. I do know the variables that I have in the model. So this is known. And somehow I want to exploit this model structure, exploit links towards the policy function to somehow back out, recover the policy function, or at least an approximation of the policy function. And we will do this implicitly using the implicit function theorem and chain rules uh, for derivatives. Okay, so this is the, the mathematical background. Then the fourth ingredient is how do I recover, how do I back out f using the implicit function theorem um, the approximation of my policy function given my dynamic model equations, well, we are going to use Taylor approximation of some order K. So this is the fourth ingredient. And the underlying idea is that I can, uh, I want an approximation, or I'm doing an approximation of my policy function with a Taylor expansion of some order K, and I'm computing the coefficients of the of that Taylor approximation from a 
Taylor expansion of my model equations. So there is a link between the coefficients of the Taylor expansions of f to the coefficients of the Taylor expansion of g. And I'm exploiting this link using the implicit function theorem. For Taylor expansions, I need an, a point where I'm going to do the Taylor expansion. And typically what we do uh, is to look at the non-stochastic steady state. That is when I kill all stochastics, set my perturbation parameter to zero. Now, before we proceed, um, I have to introduce notation that is very commonly used in the literature on perturbation. Um, the general idea is to condense the indices. So for instance, uh, u without any index uh, will denote u in period t with a plus index, this will be t plus one. Um, very similar for, y, for my t variables and the different groups of variables that I have, the star and the double star variables. So if you find a zero, at, uh, as an index at the y, so those are variables evaluated in period t. Um, the same, the similar idea for t minus one variables, so there will be a minus, again, for all endogenous variables, or the star or the double star variables, and similarly, a plus for t plus one variables. Now, I'm introducing x as shorthand notation for previous state variables, okay? So this is yt minus one star, the star variables, the predetermined and mixed variables in period t minus one, what I call the current state of my economy, okay? So this is what I denote shorthand by x. And with the bar, all those variables can be evaluated, uh, will be evaluated at the non-stochastic steady states. And lastly, the hat notation denotes deviations from the steady state. So for instance, x hat is yt minus one star minus the steady state of the star variables. Okay, now let me use this notation on my policy function concept. And it will become useful to distinguish the different groups of variables. So I can dis distinguish the g function and focus only on the relevant terms for the star variables. So this is what I then we'll call g star function. Um, the input arguments are the same. And also for the double star, um, then I will only focus on those terms of the g function um, that are relevant to determine the values of the double star, the jumper variables, okay? So this is then denoted by g double star. Now, what about yt plus one double star? Um, I mean, we have this g double star function which is then a function of yt star. And for yt star, I can plug this in. So in the end, I can also express my jumper variables in terms of the policy function for the double star variables and the star variables. And basically I end up with x u sigma u plus. So those are the input arguments to the policy functions that determine yt plus one double star, yt and, and yt star and yt double star, of course. Okay, and this combination of g star star and g star function, um, sometimes I will simply use uppercase g for this construct. Now, let me re-express the dynamic model that I have also in terms of policy function, okay? So here I'm trying to show you that there is a link and an implicit link between the model equations that we know and the policy functions that we do not know. And this is very similarly, um, remember the dynamic model was a function of previous state variables of all endogenous variables and of future jumper variables and of shocks. And now let me plug in the definition of my policy function in here. So the notation for this guy was only just x, y is zero on the previous slide. So we saw that this is the um, policy function for yt. And here we had the policy function, the joint, the combined policy function for yt plus one double star variables and the u. And of course, sometimes I'm going to use or look at that the only there are four input arguments, so this is actually a uppercase g function, which I don't know, okay? But we will somehow try to approximate that 
and see how this looks like. But here you can already see that implicitly the g function that I do not know is in my f function, which I do know. All right, so when I plug in this g function, I will use uppercase f to focus really on now I'm looking at the model equations at this implicit definition of my model equation implicit in terms of policy function. Okay, now what are the input arguments of this uppercase F and this G function? Well, those were X, U, U plus and Sigma. So let me collect that in this vector R. What are the input arguments for my G double star um, function? that was yt star u plus and sigma and here again re-expressing this in terms of policy function I'm defining this vector w which is actually a function of r x u u plus sigma okay so this that we that we were going to use for the perturbation approach and lastly the so-called dynamic variables of my model. So those were the previous state variables, all endogenous variables, the jumper variables at t plus one and the shocks. So those are what we typically call the dynamic variables in Dynair. They are also a function of x u u plus sigma when I uh, introduce the policy function concept into those variables. Okay, so here you can see that this is x u u plus and sigma. So Z, the dynamic model variables are also a function of previous states, the current observed shocks, future shocks, and the sigma parameter. Okay, and sometimes I'm going to use uppercase G, sometimes I'm going to distinguish the double star and the star parts of the policy function. Now, what is the objective? First of all, we know how to solve for the point that I'm looking at. And typically this is the non-stochastic steady state. That is whenever we set the sigma parameter equals to zero, we can, we have ways either analytically or some way numerically to compute one point, one very special point, for instance, the sto non-stochastic steady state. And this is what we typically call the static model. Okay, so let me use this uh, F with a bar notation for evaluating the dynamic model equations at the non-stochastic steady state. So here I can compute basically y bar, y bar star, y bar double star, because those are just groups of, of that variable. Now, the interesting thing is that even though I have no idea how G looks like, I do not have this function explicitly, I do know this va one value of this function whenever I evalu evaluate this G function at the non-stochastic steady state, I'm staying in the steady state. So there, there's nothing happening, okay? So this is the idea of the non-stochastic steady state. You're going to stay. So if you are in this period in the non-stochastic steady state, no shocks, nothing happened, you're going to stay in the steady state. So there is um, this, I do know one point of this G function when I evaluate it at the non-stochastic steady state, it should give me also the non-stochastic steady state. And this is very interesting because now we have established a link between the known model equations and the unknown policy function. I do know how to evaluate my model equations in one point and I do know how to evaluate my policy function in one point. So now I'm going to focus on this point and I'm trying to approximate this unknown policy function using Taylor approximation techniques or Taylor expansions. And I'm doing this, again, having this link. So I'm doing a Taylor expansion of my model equations. I get the coefficients of the Taylor approximation. And from this coefficients of the Taylor approximation, I can get the coefficients of the Taylor approximations of G. And those coefficients are with a first order Taylor expansion called GX, GU, and G sigma, or with a second order Taylor expansion, I have this one half coefficient in front, and I then have quadratic terms, GXX, 
I have GXU and GUX, which are basically the same numbers. Um, and I have GX Sigma or G Sigma X, so I have two over two. I have GUU with a one half for U squared terms and U um, Sigma and Sigma U, so I have two over two right here. And I also have um, the Sigma squared terms. And a third order approximation would give you a GXXX, GXXU, GX Sigma, GXUU, GXU Sigma, GX Sigma Sigma, GUU, GUU Sigma, uh, GU Sigma Sigma, and G Sigma Sigma. And the Kronecker product is a nice way to form those quadratic or cubed expressions x squared x to the power of 3 um, because um, those are vectors so this is a nice representation and of course I could go even further with a fourth order approximation then I would have a 1 over 24 term etc 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 so the objective is to find those coefficients gx gu gx x u sigma g sigma sigma etc okay so once I have those coefficients I can use the just derived Taylor expansion to have an approximation of my policy function and then I can do all sorts of things. I can go ahead and simulate my model. I can go ahead and estimate the model. Okay, so once I have found this um, approximation of the policy function, I'm good to go to do any, anything else. And the key or the objective is how do I find those coefficient matrices? And very importantly, we started with a problem to solve a functional equation and now the problem to solve a matrix equation, just a bunch of numbers. Okay, so this is much simpler. And this is all due to us using the Taylor expansion, the implicit function theorem. Okay, all those terms are evaluated in the one point that I know what the value of my function and also the value of all the derivatives of these functions are equal to. Okay, so at the non-stochastic steady state. One word of caution or the underlying assumption that we have um, to, to make this whole perturbation approach work is that F and G are sufficiently differentiable so that we can actually use the implicit function theorem or some generalization of that and it, this actually applies. Okay. Now for my model equations, this assumption is easily checked. I mean, I'm creating my model. I can tell you that the log function uh, is uh, sufficiently differentiable, for instance. Um, for G, we typically only assume this, okay? We assume that because F fulfills those assumptions, for instance, the sufficient differentiable assumption, and we assume now that G will probably behave similarly. And this is, in a sense, logical and credible for me at least, um, but there is like no formal proof that we can do to, to actually show this to you because we do not know G, the G function. Okay, so this is maybe one caveat that we have. This whole perturbation approximation technique only works when we can actually make use of the implicit function theorem. And there are ways that people have looked or have adapted the perturbation approach to, ma to make it use for occasionally binding constraints, to make it use in a Markov switching environment. Okay, so, so there are ways to adapt this perturbation approach for us. This is the very important assumption that we have. For F, this is th we can prove this. For G, this is much harder to prove and we can only assume this. Okay, now we have to talk even more about notation. Um, and in this presentation, I want to really show you the connection between either using everything with matrix notations or everything in te so-called tensor notations. And I hope that I can make the clear connection between those two different ways to approach higher order derivatives are more clearer to you. So why is this important? Well, with higher order perturbations, we have to um, use some way or some multivariate version of the impl implicit function theorem. And this requires us, again, implicit function theorem, to make use of multidimensional chain rules. And writing those down on paper, but also providing computer code that do this is a bit tedious and requires you to, 
to make use of good notation for that. Um, the major problem is we have many summation operations okay. and I need a good way to write this down. So typically um, conventional matrix notation becomes somewhat unwieldy at uh, orders uh, above two unless you know what you're doing and I will show you how you can still make use of um, conventional matrix notation for uh, those multidimensional chain rules but this is a bit more tricky and requires auxiliary matrices. Um, what is much more intuitive once you grasp the basic idea of tensors, it is much more concise but definitely requires getting used to. Now what is a tensor? A tensor A is a multidimensional array. Um, so this is just a collection of numbers and we use indices alpha j um, to access the elements in this array. So a vector is a one-dimensional tensor. Okay, so and I use the for a column vector the row index to access the fifth entry. A matrix is a two-dimensional array. I use two indices, the row and the column, a row number and a column number to find a certain value. A book of matrices might be a three-dimensional array. So I give you the page of the book, I give you the row and the column number, and you can access the number in this book. A bookshelf with many books might be a four-dimensional array. I give you the number for the book, I give you the page of the book, I give you the row and the column. And rooms in your house might be a five-dimensional array. So I give you the number of the room in your house, the number of the book in your bookshelf, the number, of the page number, the column number and the row number, etc. Okay, so arrays are just a way to access certain numbers using indices. Now formally this is a mapping um, defined between those indices um, and they assign a real value entry which I will always denote with square brackets. And the indices, which exact value I'm using, or which exact indices I'm using, are written as an index here. So alpha 1, alpha 2, whatever. Now, Einstein summation notation is a very compact way um, to express terms in a multivariate Taylor series expansion. Um, and here it is important to look where the indices are, whether they are uh, on top or on the bottom of those square brackets. Um, and the idea here is to eliminate summation symbols. We're still doing the summations, but I'm introducing a different notation for that by making different use of the location of indices. So if the same index use is used first as a subscript on one tensor, times another tensor and I use the same index as a superscript, then this is notation for a summation of the products. Now this sounds confusing, but let me give you a couple of examples. So let me first of all focus on a one-dimensional tensor A. So this is basically a vector of size n and another vector B of size n. So what I want to do is I want to sum the entry, the first entry of A times the first entry of B plus the second entry of A times the second entry of B plus the third entry of A times the third entry of B, etc. up to the nth entry. So this is what I want to use and I want to get rid of this sums to condense the notation. And this is where Einstein summation notation comes very handy because it reuses the index alpha 1, the sum index, uh, first as a subscript and then as a superscript and whenever I have this case I'm actually computing the sums over this running index alpha 1. Okay, so very importantly you have to look if you find square brackets with an index so if the index is used at first as a subscript and as a superscript this means summation. If it is only used as a subscript, this means access the alpha 1 entry. Similarly for um, a one-dimensional tensor, so a vector A of size n, a vector B of size m, and a matrix, a two-dimensional 
tensor D of size n by m. So I'm using the alpha 1 and alpha 2 first as a subscript and then as a superscript, which means, this is the definition of Einstein's summation notation I'm using here, that I'm computing the double sum of running index alpha 1, alpha 2, up to the dimension of D, the first dimension, the second dimension, so n and m, and then I'm accessing the alpha 1, alpha 2 element, multiplying with the alpha 1 element of A and alpha 2 element of B. And the same applies to the two-dimensional tensor D, again a matrix size n by m, and another matrix E of size n by m. So whenever I'm using alpha 1 and alpha 2 first as a subscript, then as a superscript, I'm actually computing sums. Two indices here, so I'm computing a double sum. And the index of the first sum is alpha 1, the index of the second sum is alpha 2. They go up to the, the limits are corresponding to the dimension, the first dimension of D, the second dimension of D. For the E matrix where I'm using it as a, su as a superscript, this is accessing the individual elements at this index. Similar for a vector A of size n, another vector B of size m, and a third vector C of size O, and then a three-dimensional tensor of size n, m, and o. So alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, and the same index is used as a, as a superscript. So I'm computing three sums now. Those are the indices. They go up to the individual dimensions of f, so n, m, and o. And I'm accessing the alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 index of the three-dimensional tensor, multiplying it with the alpha 1 entry of a, the alpha 2 entry of B and the alpha 3 entry of C, plus continuing this, the three sums. And my last example um, for a vector of size n, a matrix of size m and o, and a three dimensional tensor of size n, m, and o. Again, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, used first as a subscript, then as a superscript on those ter individual terms is equivalent to me computing the sums, the threefold sum here, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 become the index number. They go up to the dimension of f, the first, the second, and the third dimension, and I'm accessing the entry here of f, the entry alpha 1 of a, and the entry alpha 2, alpha 3 of d. So very importantly, so whenever you have square brackets, have a look where the indices are. If there is just a sub-index and nothing else, no superscript index, then this means only access these elements in the array in the tensor. If we have that the same indices are used first as a subscript, then as a superscript, this means I'm computing sums. Okay, so keep that in mind. Okay, the next important ingredient for a k-order perturbation approximation is Fadi Bruno's formula. So this is an identity in mathematics generalizing the chain rule to higher derivatives. Remember for the implicit function theorem we require multi-dimensional chain rules and Fadi Bruno's formula is actually a result from mathematics, a very famous identity that generalizes uh, the chain rule to higher derivatives. Now we can write down the formula in Einstein's summation notation the following way for my uppercase f. Okay, so this basically is a partial derivative with respect to a bunch of variables using uh, Einstein's summation notation. Even though we see a couple of sums here, you do, you should notice that I'm using an index below here and the same index up there. Okay, so under the hood, there are even more summations here. And we will go into these formulas uh, in a second in more detail. But we um, just stating the Fadi Bruno's formula for uppercase f for my dynamic model equations expressed in terms of x, u, u plus, and sigma, and the same for my uppercase g function in terms of um, r, 
remember r was the vector of x, u, u plus, and sigma. Okay, so any combination of those variables, uh, if I take the partial derivative of either g or f, um, with respect to any combination of x, u, u plus, and sigma, this can be re-expressed by this formula. This is an identity given through a very famous result in mathematics. The indices right here, this tau and this tau here is actually in bold phase, so these are compressed. So this belongs tau 1, tau 2, up to tau k, right? And so is gamma l as well. This is actually a bold index, gamma 1, gamma 2, and up to gamma l are the corresponding uh, integer number, are the corresponding numbers, and the same for this phi l as well. Okay, now let me go into more detail. So let's focus first on the first part of this, okay? So I'm using this notation, again, this is a tensor, right? So I have an i up here, I have rk as a subscript to uppercase f, and I have this boldface compressed tau k vector um, below here. So what is this notation for? Well, first of all, let's denote the tensor, right? Uppercase f are my dynamic model equations. So this is just a vector. So I'm picking the i-th equation. Okay, so let me denote this guy over here as the i-th dynamic model equation. Then this number right here is the kth partial derivative. Okay, so I'm taking the kth partial derivative with respect to which variables? With respect to variables in R, remember, in R, I had x, u, u plus, and sigma. x is a vector, u is a vector, u plus is a vector, sigma is just a number. So any combination of, let me say, the second state variable, the third current shock, and the second future shock, and the perturbation parameter. So I want to take the fourth um, derivative with respect to this combination of variables. Okay, so this is what this notation corresponds to. Okay, so this is the kth partial derivative of equation i with respect to variables in R selected by integers tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, up to tau k. And again, tensor notation, R is a vector, so I'm accessing the tensor by an index tau 1, this is just a number, tau 2, etc. Okay, so so this is the first part. Now, what is this? This is very similar to what we just had, but this is now focusing on lowercase f. So Fadi Bruno's formula, again, is a formula for chain rules. So uppercase f was a combination of functions, okay? So on the outer function was lowercase f. And then we had a couple of inner functions, okay? So this is here you can really see the chain rule. So this notation right here, again, let's denote lowercase f, just with the i, the i dynamic model equation. Then this term over here, this red one, is the elf partial derivatives, okay, so zl of equation i with respect to z, with respect to the dynamic variables. Remember, we stacked in this z vector yt minus 1 star, yt, yt plus 1 double star, and u. So I am, say, I want to take the second partial derivative with respect, and then I'm picking a dynamic variable. Let's say the first yt minus 1 star variable and the second u, uh, shock in ut. Okay, then I would index those accordingly by integers, so gamma 1 and whatever the number is for the second shock of ut in this vector z. So, and this is this these gamma numbers are just indexing elements in this vector z. So this over here is very similar to what we just saw. It's the elf partial derivative of the i-th equation of model, of the dynamic model equation um, with respect to stuff indexed from the dynamic model variables. Similarly, the last term right here, um, 
I'm having z, z is the vector of my dynamic variables. I'm taking the partial derivatives with respect to r, to which order? The order is determined by this um, cardinality of cm. So we will talk about cm in a bit. So this is just a number to the second, to the third, whatever. And then we, we saw that I can also re-express the dynamic variables in terms of the r vector, which contained x, u, u plus and sigma. So I'm taking with respect to some combination of x, u, u plus sigma, um, I'm taking the partial derivative of z with respect to some combination of x, u, u plus and sigma. So this is this basically tells me that, okay, so whatever the order is of how my, I'm indexing, so I'm indexing those elements in this um, r vector in a very certain way with using again just numbers, but these numbers again index to uh, pick very specific elements and we will talk about that on the next slide. But this is also just a partial derivative. So what we see here is I have a partial derivative on the left hand side and this is re-expressed as a partial derivative, partial outer derivative times the sum of partial inner derivatives. Okay, so this is what a chain rule is. Now let's talk about this CM and this uh, index for the sum. Um, what is that? Well, this is a bit tricky because this, uh, this are results from combinatorics. So this MLK is a set, a so-called equivalent set or Bell polynomial. Now this is defined as the so-called set of all partitions green C of the set of K indices, so say one, two, three, with a certain number of classes L. If I have that, then I'm denoting with C M, the Mth class of this partition, and the, um, and the absolute value is basically, I'm counting how many elements are in this set. Okay, so this is what we typically call a cardinality in a set math. And this tau of whatever the numbers are in this CM class of partition um, is a basically indexing certain taus. Now th those tau of CM reference some number, some entry in the R vector. And whenever this corresponds to the perturbation parameter, we actually ignore that index. Okay, let me give you a, an example. Okay, so let's have a look at the M2K equivalence set. So I have K equals three. So I have the uh, three indices, one, two, and three. And I have L equals two. So I have two classes. Now, how can I, this is again combinatorics, how can I put those three numbers, one, two, three, into two classes? So I could say one class contains only the one, then the other one uh, would contain two and three. I could also say one class contains the two and the other class contains one and three. Or I could say the first class is three and the second class is one and two. So I have three partitions of the set of three indices with two classes. And this is what we then call the M2K equivalent set or Bell polynomial. Now the cardinality of CM, so the cardinality of C1, there's only one element here, so this is just one. Of C2, there are two numbers here, so this would be two. Okay, one and two, one and two. So in the sum right here, I would first take the first partial derivative, because the cardinality is just one, times the second partial derivative. All right, I hope this is not as confusing because it really just get, needs to get used to this notation and it is very concise, it is very shorthand and it is very precise uh, to work with particularly higher order perturbation approximation formulas. Now let me give you some examples uh, so we, get, we start getting used to this notation. Okay, so let's have a look at, this is the general formula right here, and let's write down the first derivative of equation i with respect to the 
alpha one state variable. So for instance, you have a DSG model with three equations and the second equation is the capital accumulation equation. So I want you to take the derivative of the capital accumulation equation with respect to um, previous, the previous capital stock, okay? And this is just a number, right? So, and I want you to store this number into this object right here. So using the formula above, we have first order derivative, so k is equals to one. So the first sum runs from L equals one to one. So I only have fz1. fz1, gamma L is a compressed boldface vector, but there's only one entry, so it's uncom so it's uh, low, so it's not bold face anymore. And then you can see that I have the same index gamma one right here and up there. And we know that this is basically telling me I am using Einstein summation notation. So this is a sum. The index is gamma one. How many, what is the, the upper limit of the, the sum? Well, I have to look what is the actual variable. This is Z and z is the, are the dynamic variables and there are nz of those. And then I'm doing the outer times inner derivative. Okay, so this is the chain rule here. So outer derivative of this equation with respect to first the dynamic, a certain dynamic variable, and then take the derivative of that dynamic variable with respect to whatever state variable you are interested in. And the equivalent set for whenever L equals one and K equals one, there's only just one number and I can I'm need to put this in one class. So there's just one. Now let's write down or use this notation to write down the second order derivative. So K equals two of equation I with respect to again, the alpha one state variable, so say the second state variable, and to the third current shock variable, so some beta one current shock variable. Okay, so alpha one and beta one are just numbers. Okay, it tell, just tells you, is it the first, second, third, fourth state variable, or is it the first, second, third, etc. shock variable. And in all slides coming, I'm using um, alpha to index state variables and I'm using beta to index current shocks and I'm going to use delta to index future shocks. Okay, so I'm trying to um, keep the notation clean here. So shorthand notation for this using my tensor notation because this is just really a number. This is not a matrix, so this is just a number, an expression that I, I can compute on paper and uh, plugging in values for all the variables and parameters, this is just a number. So this second order derivative of equation I with respect to the alpha first X state variable and with respect to the beta first U variable is equal using Fadi Boon's formula. Again, I have now L equals one and K is two. So let's start with L equals one. So I have FZL right there gamma one only, okay. And then I need to take the sum of the M12 equivalent set, which is given right here. Okay, so there's only one set in this. Then I have the first class of this partition, which is also the only class of this partition. And the first number is a one and the second number here is a two, but there are two numbers here. So this ZR will be raised to the cardinality of two. Okay, and here you can see that Z is a second order partial derivative because I'm taking it now with respect to X and respect to U. Okay, notice that in R I have X, U, U plus and Sigma. Here I'm really just focusing on, on the X part and just one of those X's and on the U part and just one of those U's. Okay, and this is, so here this is a second order partial derivative and the indices to which state and which shock are given below here. Gamma one here and gamma one there means this is a sum Einstein summation notation. Okay, so this corresponds really to the outer derivative times the inner derivative. 
and the index is gamma 1. Okay, so this is Einstein's summation notation for this part. Good, this was L equals 1, but we now have an additional term, L equals 2. Okay, so Fz raised to the power of 2. So I have Fzz. Okay, so this is a second order partial derivative of the ith equation of f with respect to the gamma first dynamic variable and with respect to the gamma second dynamic variable times now I need to have a look at the m22 equivalent set which is con contains two classes okay in one I have one and the other one I have the two so I'm taking the product right here, so m equals 1 and l is equals to 2, so I need to take the product first of z r to, how many entries are here, just 1, so z r 1, and what what is the first index that I am referencing this to? Well, this is the alpha first x, okay, so this is the alpha first x. So this is the first product term and then m equals 2 will give you the second product term. And this notation here, this tau out of cm, basically tells you um, my tau vector contains alpha 1 and beta 1. And this tau of cm tells you take the first one, so alpha 1, when m equals 1. And take the second one when m equals 2 beta 1. So that's why you see an alpha 1 here and a beta 1 there. Now gamma 1, gamma 1, gamma 1, gamma 1. This is again Einstein's summation notation. So this is a double sum where the index corresponds to gamma 1 and gamma 2 and z has nz entries. Okay, so this is the outer derivative, the second order partial outer derivative times the inner derivatives, the product of the inner derivatives right here or the cross derivative. Third order derivative of equation i with respect to the alpha 1th and alpha 2th state variable and to some current shock variable. So I'm interested in f, x, x, u, third order partial derivative, and alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1 tells me which state the alpha 1th, which state the alpha 2th, which shock the beta 1th shock. Okay, so again, this is just a number. Now evaluating these terms, again, I have to start at L equals 1 because K is now 3. I have to do, I have, I'm finding that this is first Fz. And then I have to look into the equivalent set M13, which only contains one class, 1, 2, 3. So I'm accessing the first index, second index, and third index. And that you can see here. So the first index was alpha 1, the second index was alpha 2, and beta 1. Okay, so this gives me z x x u. Again, gamma 1 here, gamma 1 there. This is actually a sum. Einstein summation notation. Now L equals 2. L equals 2 means I have f z z right there. I have gamma 1 and gamma 2. Gamma 1, gamma 2. And then I have the sum over the partitions of this equivalent set m23. And in this equivalent set m23 I now have one two three partitions and um, in this product in the first term of the product I'm always picking just one index and in the second product I'm picking two indices okay so this is why you can see that there is zx just one alpha one zx the next one alpha two okay so this is one alpha one the first index the 2 right here would be the second index, which is alpha 2. And the 3 right here is the third index, which is, uh, in my case, beta 1. And the second product, whenever m equals 2, um, are the second and third index. So alpha 2, beta 1. Bam. The first and third, which is alpha 1, beta 1. And the first and second, which is alpha 1, alpha 2. Okay, so this would be this expression right here. And again, gamma 1 below here, gamma 2 here, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 1, gamma 2. So this is Einstein's summation notation. And this would correspond to this partial derivatives, outer derivative times inner derivatives, and the sum of those. And the third one, 
when L is equals to three, I have F Z Z Z right there. Sorry, right there. I have three indices for which Z's gamma one, gamma two, gamma three. And my equivalent set M33 is now given by one partition that has three classes. Okay, in the first class there's one, two, and three. And each of these classes only contains one element, so the cardinality here is always one. And you can see that that CX index get the first index, CX get the second one, CU get the third one. So this is what this tau of CM means. Okay. Now, another example for third order derivative um, with respect to equation, the alpha first state variable and to the beta one and beta two current, current shock works more or less the same. Okay, so this is another example of this notation uh, for you maybe to practice that. The equivalent sets are exactly the same. As I was saying on the previous slide, um, whenever I'm using indices, I'm using alpha to index state variables, I'm using beta to index current shocks and delta to index future shocks. Okay, so here you have an example where I'm also interested in the third order partial derivative with respect to a future shock variable. Okay, so this can also be re-expressed with the same notation at hand. Now let me give you the last example, which has is a third order deri derivative of equation i with respect to some alpha one state variable, and now with respect to the perturbation parameter and again to the perturbation parameter. Okay, so this is a third order derivative, but there's only one index because the perturbation parameter is just one number. It's not a vector. I do not need to index anything there. So how does this work? Because here we have to be a bit care careful um, and, or in other words, this tau of CM um, ignores indices when they correspond to the perturbation parameter. Okay, so this is an example for, for that notation. Okay, so um, which is, now let's start with L equals one. I have FZ gamma one right there. And I have the M13 partition, which has one class that contains um, uh, three elements, so the cardinality is three, so I'm taking the third partial derivative with respect to x, sigma, and sigma. This tau of cm now tells me uh, with respect to the first index, which is alpha one, with respect to the second index, there is no second index because this would correspond to the perturbation parameter, so I'm ignoring that, and the third index is also corresponding to the perturbation parameter. There is no um, index for that, so I'm ignoring this. So this is a special case whenever you take derivatives with respect to the um, perturbation parameter, you ignore indices in those CMs when they correspond to the perturbation parameter. But the remaining um, expressions are the same. Okay, now we have all those tensor expressions, the individual partial derivatives. And sometimes it's useful to actually work with a matrix representation. So I not only want to have, or I want to store all the individual's partial derivatives of any equation with respect to any combination of x's, u's, u pluses, or sigmas in a matrix. And this is what is called tensor unfolding in the literature. Now, how does this work? Um, so we want to express all tensors or we want to put those in the matrix. A matrix has only two dimensions, rows and columns, okay? So the basic idea is, or the basic questions one has to ask, how do I map a multidimensional tensor to a two-dimensional matrix? Okay, so remember like for three-dimensional arrays, which was the book, how do I uh, get rid of this third dimension. So I could rip out all the pages and put them right next to each other. Okay, so then I would only have two dimensions. So you have to think about how you reorganize the numbers. How do you map a multidimensional tensor to a two-dimensional matrix? And the mapping we are using is that the rows 
correspond to model equations i and the columns correspond to a very specific ordering of the individual tensors um, to which variables I'm taking the partial derivative. So the, the underlying and very natural approach is you have those tau indices. So the tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, up to tau k indices that all run from 1 to n. And now let's, let's simply run a for loop and store, compute the tensor and store it in the first column, compute the next tensor and the next one and the next one and the next one, and you get your columns uh, sequentially or you fill in the columns sequentially. Um, what this would give you, the example ordering is, so say you you're doing, you have k equals three and you have only uh, three, um, three entries in the dr vector. So you would have that the first column would correspond to the first, with, to a third order partial derivative with respect to the first, first, first variable, to three times the first variable. The next column would be one, one, two, one, one, three. And then we would start over one, two, one, one, two, two, one, two, three, etc. And I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27 columns. Okay, so those would be, those would be all the third order partial derivatives with respect to any combination of variables in R. And say this entry right here, the fifth row of this matrix and the 20th column of this matrix, then this would correspond to the partial derivative of the fifth equation with respect to the third variable first, then to the first variable, and then to the second variable. Okay, so I'm storing the individual tensors in a very certain specific way in a matrix, and this is what is known as tensor unfolding. Um, there are different ways to map tensors into two-dimensional matrices. This one right here is um, very useful for our purposes. Now, how can you actually do this? Of course, simply running loops um, is somewhat computationally in inefficient. The alternative that I want to present you is we can actually make use of basic matrix multiplication rules of the properties of the Kronecker product and make use of permutation matrices that perform um, required reorderings of terms such that tensor summations do correspond and are in accordance with matrix multiplication and Kronecker product rules. Um, Dynair under the hood uses such tensor unfolding for at order two, but actually at order three and above, we um, use a different library specifically designed to deal with multidimensional tensors and that is written in C++. This can change with future version, but as of version 5.1, this is what we do. Now, Sounds confusing, let me give you some examples. How would I tensor unfold all partial, first order partial derivatives with respect to the alpha one state variable? How would I put those in a matrix? So this was the equation given by Fadi Bruno's formula. And this is very, again, we have Einstein summation notation. And if you have a look at the definition of Einstein summation notation, the unfolding into a matrix, again, the rows correspond to the model equations i and the columns correspond then to uh, when alpha one is just one, alpha one, two, alpha two, uh, one, three, etc. to a natural ordering right here. And this is exactly the definition of matrix multiplication rules. Okay, so basic matrix multiplication rules are, uh, can be used to unfold expressions like this. Now, what about second order partial derivatives with respect to some state x1 index by alpha one and some shock index by beta one? Um, that was given by Fadi Bruno's formula. Um, this is the same, very similar to what we just had, right? When we unfold this, we can simply make use of basic matrix multiplication rules. This term over here is a bit more difficult because I have now three terms. And one can show that if you do this 
natural ordering of variables that you first that the first column corresponds to alpha one being one and beta one being one the next column corresponds to alpha one being one and beta one being two and then alpha one being one and beta one being three and say the, that was it with betas then we would start over and start with alpha one equals two and beta one equals one alpha one equals two and beta one equals two and so on if you want this exact ordering what you can use is basic mul matrix multiplication rules for these terms and the Kronika product for this term right here okay because it has the same ordering alpha one and beta one um, as we have here so the Kronika product zx Kronika that you unfolds this for any combination of alpha ones and beta ones correctly if you want this certain ordering that I propose here okay now what about third partial derivatives third order partial derivatives so some alpha 1x some alpha 2x and some beta 1u and actually I want to look at all possible combinations of alpha 1 alpha 2 and beta 1 and store them in this ordering starting with alpha 1 being 1 alpha 2 being 1 beta 1 being 1 and then alpha 1 1 alpha 2 1 beta 1 2 etc 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 okay how do I unfold this um, so let me first have a look at the tensor equation right here given by Fadi Bruno's formula this guy over here uh, is the same as on the previous slides I can simply use um, matrix so this is a matrix and this is a vector I can use basic matrix multiplication rules which will give me the correct ordering um, here I have a I would have a matrix of third order partial derivatives times vector 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 which where I can use again a Kronika product okay so I would have a three I would have three terms in my Kronika product this can be also very easily um, unfolded now for the red and green terms we first have to ideally notice something um, I'm multiplying some element of zx the alpha one element and some element of zx the alpha tooth element right here right and then zx zxu alpha two beta one alpha one beta one so those so if I unfold and if I'm using for instance the Kronika product of zx Kronika zxu okay so those contain the same values but they are summed in different ordering so sometimes I have to uh, take uh, I have to take different combinations of those terms okay so note that zx is here and there and ZX, zxu is there and there so this basically contains the same terms but I have to add them up differently I have to permute them when I'm using tensor unfolding techniques for the last the, the green term this is um, um, there I also have one little problem I might not have the correct ordering that the Kronika product is correctly unfolding because I'm starting with beta 1 right there and not with alpha 1 and I have but I have alpha 1 and alpha 2 so there are a couple of tricks that we would need to do to unfold this nicely with the basic multiplic matrix multiplication rules and the Kronika product so for the to unfold the red terms I would need to use so-called permutation matrices because zx Kronika zxu contain the correct terms but I do need to permute them I do need to put them at different places in the matrix and this zu zxx um, I actually need in this case to take zxx Kronika zu and not the other way around so let me be a bit more precise the red tensor terms contain the same values but are summed in different orderings right so that was the first sum which starts with alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 this is consistent with alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 and we can use the Kronika product to unfold this so this is my shortcut to check whether I need to permute something whether I need to change something have a look whether 
the indices below are in the same ordering as the term up front. Okay, so if it's alpha one, alpha two, beta one, then you can use simply the Kronecker product. Now, the other term starts with alpha two, alpha one, beta one. This is not consistent with, it does not start with alpha one and then alpha two and beta one, but it can be unfolded with a permutation matrix. So this permutation matrix basically takes, it's an identity matrix, but puts the ones from the identity matrix, it switches columns around to be consistent with my ordering that I want to have in my matrix. So as a, it is a permuted identity matrix. Now this P2 X, XU matrix is basically then the identity matrix plus this permutation matrix. So this will be a matrix containing twos or ones. Then let me have a look at the green tensor. Um, the green tensor was given by this, and this also did not have the required alpha one, alpha two, beta one ordering to make use of the Kronecker product. Um, but this is a symmetric matrix, the FZZ. So it doesn't matter if I take uh, the partial derivative first with respect to the gamma first variable and then to the gamma second variable, it's the same entry I will get if I take the if I take first the partial derivative with respect to the gamma tooth variable and then to the gamma first variable. So I can switch around the gamma ones and gamma two. So I can make this a gamma one and gamma two, switching them around as well. And then let me write this, this is just a number, this is just a number, I can write this up front. And now I have alpha one, alpha two, beta one. Um, I have the correct ordering right here. Okay, so I can then make use of the Kronecker product because this has is consistent with the alpha one, alpha two, beta one ordering and can then be unfolded. Yet another example, FXUU, alpha one, beta one, beta two. So I have a similar thing right here. I, if I'm looking at this term, again, my, sh my shortcut, I have the correct indices, alpha one, beta one, beta two. So I know I can use the Kronecker product here. Here, it doesn't start with beta one um, due to symmetry. Maybe I can put this up front and I have alpha one, beta two. Ah, it's still not the correct ordering. So I would need to use a permutation matrix here on this term. And the last term I can, due to symmetry, put this up front and I would have alpha one, beta one, beta two, which is then consistent with the Kronecker product terms. For this term, again, this is a matrix times a vector. This is basic matrix multiplication rules I can use to unfold and um, a matrix times a vector times a vector times a vector. This is then uh, here I can also simply use the Kronecker product. This is works just fine. Okay, so you would see that I can use ZX, ZUU, Kronecker plus I would need to somehow switch this around maybe and use a certain permutation matrix for these two terms and the last one is just the Kronecker product. And to be a bit more precise, what I've just told you, the green tensor is consistent with my alpha one, beta one, beta two ordering, can be unfolded by making use of the Kronecker product. Now the red tensors are summed in different orderings, right? As I was just saying, uh, it doesn't start with alpha one and then beta one, beta two but I can, due to symmetry, I can switch it around. And so I can actually make use of ZXU. So start the Kronecker product with ZXU and then ZU. For the other red term, this trick um, does not work because it then starts with alpha one, which is good, but then it has beta two and I would like to have beta one actually there. So I need to permute the corresponding Kronecker product matrix uh, sorry, the corresponding Kronecker product, and I'm using a permutation matrix. Again, this permutation matrix is just an identity matrix where I'm switching around the columns in a very specific way that is consistent with my ordering I want in my matrix. So the overall permutation matrix is again, just the identity matrix plus this PXU matrix. There you go. Yet another example of F, X, U and U plus, so here I have one, two, so again, this term is not a problem, basic matrix multiplication rules. This term, just use the Kronecker product right here on the last three 
guys. Now, for the other ones, I have I need to check the ordering, right? Alpha one, beta one, delta one. Then I can make use of my Chronica product because this is the correct unfolding then. Um, alpha one, beta one, delta one. I know due to symmetry, uh, when I switch this around, it gets the correct ordering. So I need to switch places right here, ZXU and ZU plus. And here I can switch places, but then the delta one is at second place and not in the third place. So here I would need to use a permutation matrix to unfold these tensors, all the tensors in a matrix. Okay, and the details, I've written them down here again, that uh, what I just said. And yet another example containing also the perturbation parameter. So I'm just giving you examples with all sorts of combinations of X, U, U plus and sigmas because they all work similar even if you go to like fifth or sixth or seventh order um, approximations then those tense unfolding techniques would work very similarly. So the beauty or the, the, the nice thing about whenever there is a sigma in there, there is no index. Okay, so I could actually, this unfolding this is very easy, but to stick in the flow of the algorithm of taking tensors and unfolding them with Kronika products, basic matrix multiplication rules and permutation matrices, I'm still um, showing you how to do this in the, in the steps, okay? So beta one is the first index, which is fine, so I can simply use the Kronika product. Then we would have the beta one is back there due to symmetry, I could put it up front and then the Kronika product starting with ZU Sigma is the correct unfolding. But the Sigmas, if I had indices, I would need to permute them as well. So there might be um, a permutation matrix needed here. Actually, there isn't, but uh, just to stick to the flow of the algorithm. Okay, so I've, I've laid it out here. Um, the green tensors, of course, just a product of vectors when they are unfolded and we can simply use Kronika products. Um, so you don't really need this permutation matrix right here and this would actually be just a two. Okay, now we have all the ingredients, all the mathematical background, all the stuff needed to understand the perturbation approximation at any order. And maybe let me be uh, a bit clear. This was a very sophisticated, or this was a very sophisticated way to lay out the ingredients needed to understand the perturbation approximation. If you're just doing a first order perturbation approximation or just a second and even just a third order perturbation approximation, you most likely won't need all the tools that I discussed. However, I want to lay out a general algorithm, a general algorithmic way to um, start with the first order, then go to the second, then go to the third, and go up to any order that you want to do. And this is exactly what we do in Dynair. So those tools that we discussed, the tensors, the matrix unfolding techniques, um, the Einstein summation notation, Fadi Bruno's formula, this is very important to understand um, higher order perturbation techniques, particularly if you want to look into the algorithms. So the objective is to find the coefficients of the k-order Taylor expansion of g. Okay, so with respect to a number of x's, a number of u's, and a number of sigmas. And the algorithm is recursive. So first we start at with a first order approximation, find all coefficients gx, gu, g sigma, then we find all coefficients of order 2, gxx, gxu, gx sigma, g u u, g u sigma, g sigma sigma, and then we go ahead and find all coefficients of order 3, so gxx, gxx u, etc, etc, okay? Now, even though we covered this already, the first order approximation, let me show you how this algorithmic framework also applies to the first order approximation. So let's do a first order Taylor expansion of the Eve equation of uppercase F around the non-stochastic steady state. So when X is at X bar, U is zero, U plus is zero, and Sigma is also zero. And this is given in tensor notation 
using Fadi Bruno's formula in Einstein's summation notation is given in the following way. Now taking the conditional expectation and setting it to zero, so what is in the information set, so x is in the information set, u is in the information set, sigma is in the information set, but not u plus. But we know that u plus is sigma times eta plus, and we can then form expectation on eta plus. So this would be corresponding to this. Okay, so we have f sigma times sigma, and here we have sigma times expectation of epsilon plus, and this is denoted by this sigma one matrix. Okay, so this is the first order approximation in tensor notation. Now, of course, my model equations, when I evaluate them at the st non-stochastic steady state, this is zero, and this term over here, this is the delta first entry of the first order moment. So now for a solution, um, this equation needs to be satisfied for any value of x hat, of u, and for sigma. And the only way that this can happen is when the coefficient matrices that I multiply up front are zero. Then for any value of x hat, u, and sigma, this equation will be satisfied. So the necessary and sufficient condition, conditions to recover the first order partial derivatives of g with respect to x, u, and sigma can be retrieved from setting those coefficient matrices to zero. Now the computation is done in sequence. So we first recover gx, then we recover gu because we need gx for this, and then we would recover g sigma. Okay, let's start with gx. And first, a quick reminder, our definition of those vectors r that contain x, u, u plus, and sigma, and this w vector that contains g star of x, u, sigma, u plus, and sigma. And the definition of z, the dynamic variables, was given by this guy over here. Okay, so now we are going to evaluate Fadi Bruno's formula for uppercase fx, uppercase fu, uppercase fu plus, uppercase f sigma, and this contains uh, the partial derivatives, for instance, of w with respect to x, with respect to u, with respect to sigma, but also of z with respect to x, with respect to u, with respect to sigma, with respect to u plus. Okay, so this is why I use this notation, that w of r and z of r. So for gx, we start with taking the first order partial derivative with respect to x of wr and of zr. So this will be g with respect to x, gx star. There is no x here and there is no x there. And for z, this would be just one, um, or the identity matrix here. This would be gx, and this would be uh, g star x times, oh, sorry, this would be g double star x times g star x, and no other x here. So let me collect all those terms. So I'm going to provide you both with the tensor um, equations, but also with the corresponding unfolded matrix techniques, just to have everything on the same page. So. In tensor notation, when I take the partial derivative with respect to x, this would be just gx star to whatever variable I took the derivative with respect to. And the other rows would be zero. Unfolding, very easy, this is just gx star. Now using Fadi Bruno's formula on this uppercase g matrix um, would give you that you would need to take the g um, double star with respect to w, and then this is the outer derivative, and then the inner derivative with respect to the alpha first x. Okay, so now looking at this wx, you see that um, only for the state variables, or for the rows of the state variables, we really have something non-zero. The remaining terms are zero, so I can really focus instead of g double star w, this is actually just g double star x times this element right here. 
And how do I unfold such a thing? This is just using basic matrix multiplication rules. And then I also have the partial derivative with respect to x of the dynamic variables to one specific alpha one th x. So as I was just saying, this is then just the identity matrix or just one. Um, here I have gx and the corresponding entry and uppercase gx, which I computed right here. Okay, unfolding is very similar, very simple because these are just the matrices there. And then Fadi Bruno's formula for f uppercase fx is basically given by fz, outer derivatives, right, with respect to dynamic variables times the dynamic, the derivatives of the dynamic variables with respect to x and for all possible combinations of x. And unfolding is very simple. This is using basic matrix multiplication rules. So the underlying equation that I can solve now is fx is equal to zero. Now plugging in what I just computed for zx, I see that, remember the first entry of zx was just a one, then we had gx and then we had this uppercase gx, which was equal to this equation. And this is just the first order partial derivative of the model equations with respect to the previous state variables, um, with respect to all the variables that occur in period t, and those are the derivatives with respect to the jumper variables at t plus one. Okay, so this is the equation that I need to solve. So I could, I can also unfold this, um, which is very easy. So I simply take the Jacobian matrix here. This is also a Jacobian matrix times GX, basic multi matrix multiplication rules. And here as well, basic matrix multiplication rules to unfold this in the ordering that I want to have. Now these two equations, tensor or matrix representation, this is a quadratic matrix equation and solving it is what we've already seen in when we talked about first order approximation. This is equivalent to finding a solution to the linearized rational expectations models. There are different algorithms that have been proposed to solve for GX. And Dynair uses uh, a very efficient algorithm in a, in a sense based on the QZ. Um, matrix and the QZ decomposition, but we get rid first of static variables to reduce the underlying computational problem. Now, for higher order derivatives, particularly, um, this is important to set up the so-called perturbation matrices. Let me call them A and B. Um, those, basically, the A matrix contains um, the Jacobian with respect to the period T variables plus the Jacobian Fy plus double star times Gx. Okay, so we will see that those terms Fy0 plus this guy over here, they will come up in many equations that are that will follow and having this uh, matrix A and also this matrix B that basically is of dimension n by n and A is also n by n because static plus predetermined and mixed plus forward is our definition of the groups of all the endogenous variables and the same here static plus predetermined plus mixed and forward looking so those matrices are n by n and this makes uh, life easier later on so let's think about how do we how can we recover gu again tensor versus matrix um, so I would take the of w of my vector w, the derivative with respect to the beta one th u, and I would get g u star indexed by beta one. I can transform this. Uh, I can unfold this. Um, now the uppercase g would be u. We can compute that using again Fadi Bruno's formula. And if you have a look into w u you see there are zeros and only for um, the first rows which correspond to 
x, there is something non-zero, so I can simplify this even further. Unfolding basic matrix multiplication rules, then z with respect to some beta 1u term uh, would give me this. Unfold this. And now I have everything that I need to use Fadi Bruno's formula to compute fu either in tensor or in ma unfolded matrix representation. Okay, so ZU is given here, GU is given here, so I have everything that I need. So in more detail, if I'm looking, if I'm inserting ZU and uppercase GU, I end up with this equation right here. So I only have GU right here and I have GU right here and those are this is the partial derivative of equation i of f with respect to u beta 1. Now a tensor unfolding gives me the corresponding equation just using basic matrix multiplication rules and now you can see where this perturbation matrix A already comes in handy. So I have Fy0 right here, no star or double star, right? This is the G for all endogenous variables, but here I'm distinguishing between double star and star and using this A matrix, because I've already computed X, right? I can focus not only on GU star, but really on just GU by setting up this A matrix. So I have A times GU, there's only GU without the star um, on the right hand side here and plus FU. Now taking, of course, the inverse of A would give me G U. So let's recover G Sigma. Same steps. First, let's have a look at the um, Fadi Bruno's formula for uppercase G and then Fadi Bruno's formula for uppercase F. Um, so let's start with up, uppercase G. For this, we would need W the partial derivative of w with respect to u plus and also with respect to sigma which is given now by these terms right here um, of course i can unfold them and then uppercase g fadi bruno's formula basically tells you this equation this sum using einstein's summation notation and then you would need to look into w u plus and you see that only the rows corresponding to u plus have non-zero entries so this would i don't need to focus on g double star for all w's but only for u okay so this is why this becomes g u double star and the same i can fold this of course And the same thing for G sigma, uppercase G sigma. So this is Fadi Bruno's formula applied to my uppercase G function. Looking into W sigma, I have um, that the rows for the X, um, for the columns in my G matrix uh, corresponding to X and also to sigma. Okay, so I would have that gx right here and g sigma right here times one and times g sigma star. Okay, unfolding again, very easily done here. No permutation matrix is required. Now, the partial derivatives of z with respect to u plus or with respect to sigma are given by these terms. I have computed g u plus right here and I've computed g sigma right there, but there is another G sigma in uh, Z sigma. Tensor unfolding very easily done. And the ultimate or the one equation that I, or the, the two equations that I will then use are of course for F U plus and F sigma either in tensor or matrix notation given Fadi Bruno's formula. So let us evaluate that. So the actual equation that I needed to solve was uh, this one, right, F sigma plus F u plus times the first moment of my shocks, plugging in all, all the expressions that I've just computed will give me this equation. Okay, so, and we can even 
simplify this further by plugging in all the uh, simplified terms from the previous slide and we can either look at the tensor formula here or at the corresponding matrix formulas that we had on the previous slide plugging everything in and we get this equation right here and we see that there is a g sigma on the right hand side of fy0 and there is a g sigma star on the right hand side of fy plus double star times gx double star remember our a matrix had fy0 plus a bunch of zeros for statics but there was fy plus double star gx double star so i can again make use of my a matrix right here and my b matrix as well because fy plus times uh, sorry just fy plus um, was my basically my b matrix so i can also get rid of the double star here and the star there and really just focus on g sigma and this term carries over so this is a plus b times g sigma now this needs to be equal to zero taking the inverse of a plus b would give me that of course the first moment is zero by assumption so we don't really have to compute anything here g sigma is zero and this is a fam famous result w that we talked about uh, when we talked about first order approximation techniques this is so-called certainty equivalence so even though when you set up your model equations the agents do take into account that there are stochastics in the model they know the invariant distribution um, they do at first order when they when we solve the model or when we approximate the policy function with a first order perturbation technique we see that the actual policy function that we get is independent of the size of the covariance matrix in my stochastic innovations independent of the size of uncertainty in the model so in a sense future uncertainty does not matter for the decision rules of the agents at first order whether or not it is extremely that the world is extremely uncertain or just slightly uncertain they do not care when we solve this at first order which for many um, current research questions is not a good idea to do but very importantly certainty equivalence is a result of a first order approximation a first order perturbation approximation and we will see how we can break with this using higher order perturbation approximation techniques let's do this so let's go ahead and do a second order approximation so let's take a second order Taylor expansion of the if equation of uppercase f around the non-stochastic steady state and in tensor notation making use of Fadi Bruno's formula this would be of course the first order approximation that we just had but now we're doing a second order Taylor expansion so I have a couple of additional terms um, I have fxx I have fuu so that's basically a um, I have f u plus u plus and I have f sigma sigma as well as those cross terms of x and u and I have them two times so that's why I have a two up here so x u x u plus x sigma u u plus u sigma and u plus sigma okay so this is the full second order Taylor expansion of the if equation of f around the non-stochastic steady state and tensor notation now the same step applies that we did at the first order approximation take the conditional expectation and set this to zero so for the first order terms we already did that now what happens here this is in the information set nothing changes this is in the information set nothing changes this is not in the information set but I'm taking the conditional expectation at t of u plus and u plus and remember this was sigma times eta plus so sigma squared times the expectation of eta plus delta one and eta plus delta two so this would be the covariance matrix of my e or some element of the covariance matrix of my eta um, terms now this is in the information set and here this is in the information set this is not in the information set so I would replace u plus with Sigma times eta plus and then take the first moment there the same uh, no this is in the information set 
u plus is not in the information set but I replace it with the expectation of sigma times the expectation of eta plus and the same right here. So I end up with this was the first order expression and then the second order this was an information set you see that now I have the second moments right here and the first moments right here and uh, with sigma sigma and I also have the linear terms x times sigma and u times sigma okay now of course fr when I evaluate my model equations at the non-stochastic steady state, this is zero. Um, sigma one is the sigma one delta one is the delta first entry of my first moment, and sigma two denotes the covariance between eta one delta one and eta uh, eta t delta one and eta t delta two. Now this equation needs to be satisfied for any value of x, u, and sigma, and we saw that at first order we would set fx equal to zero, fu equal to zero, and this guy over here equal to zero to get gx, gu, g sigma. And now we do the same, so we set fxx equal to zero, fu, u equal to zero, we set this whole expression equal to zero, this guy over here equal to zero, this expression equal to zero, and this equation expression equal to zero. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six matrix equations. And I'm looking for GXX. I'm looking for GUU. I'm looking for G Sigma Sigma. I'm looking for GXU. I'm looking for GX Sigma. And I'm looking for GU Sigma. So I have six unknowns and I have six equations. This is a well-defined problem. So the necessary and sufficient conditions are for GXX, I'm evaluating this. For GU, I'm focusing on FUU. For GXU, I'm focusing on FXU. For GX Sigma, I'm focusing on not only on X Sigma, but also on XU plus times the first moment here. For u sigma, I'm focusing not only on u sigma, but also u, u plus, plus times the first moment. For sigma, I have to focus on f sigma sigma, also on f u plus u plus times the second moment, and two times f u plus times sigma. And this is actually the exact order that you need to compute stuff, because sometimes you require um, previously computed results. So you would definitely need to start with GXX because this is used in almost all of those equations here as well. Then GU, then GXU, then GX Sigma. For instance, GX Sigma is required to compute GU Sigma and at last you are finally able to compute G Sigma. So let's do this. Let's start with GXX. Again, same steps. Now we start with WX and take the derivative with respect again to some x, some x alpha 2. Okay, uh, we have computed at first order wx alpha 1 and then go ahead and take the next derivative, the second derivative with respect to alpha 2 and this would be g star xx alpha 1 alpha 2 in tensor notation or just the gx x star matrix in the matrix notation. Using Fadi Bruno's formula for uppercase g um, this would be Fadi Bruno's formula. Sin uh, since we are now doing a second order approximation right here, I have two terms. So WXX right there and WX here and WX there. Go back to the first order approximation to see that WX only contains GX star. So I can simplify this already and only focus on G star star XX already and WXX only really focuses on g star xx. So I can focus here only on x. Okay, so this is simplified. All right, and I can unfold this. And for unfolding, we now require not only basic matrix multiplication rules, but also the Kronecker product. Next would be the second uh, partial derivative with respect to x alpha 2. So go back to the first order approximation to see how zx alpha 1 looks like. Take the 
next partial derivative with respect to x alpha 2 and you would get this equation either in tensor or um, so you would get this vector uh, this you would get this expression here either in tensor or in matrix representation and finally we can we have now all the things all the ingredients to evaluate Fadi Bunu's formula for f x x in Einstein summation notation so in tensor notation or of course we can unfold this and do it in matrix notation so this was the underlying equation we can unfold this this would be like that and when I develop terms I plug in the just computed uh, expressions um, I can re-express this whole thing using my a and b matrices and I end up with a times what the unknown plus b times the unknown times some matrix right here that is known I know gx already so I also know this guy over here equals something else and that something else this fzz I know all partial derivatives of f to of any order because those are just the derivatives of my model equations which I know and zx and zx I have that from the first order approximation so this is a known this is a known b and a matrices are known so I have a so-called I have this special matrix and this is has a name this matrix this is a so-called generalized Sylvester equation so whenever you have a times unknown plus b times unknown times some matrix c equals some right hand side this is a generalized Sylvester equation and Linear has very efficient and specialized algorithm to solve exactly this equation particularly if you have that, that matrix right here if this is a Kronecker product okay so we have very efficient ways to solve this so we can simply solve that using this algorithm now to that would be already sufficient to have to get the GXX matrix but um, because I want to show you what we or to mo motivate what we do with higher orders now let me be a bit more algorithmic let me show you a bit more how one can access this uh, in the more general terms so the underlying equation that I need to feed into my computer is this one okay so I have computed the A matrix I the B matrix and I know that this is easily done this is a Sylvester equation I have a, an algorithm to do that the only thing that I want is the right hand side of this equation okay and I want to have an efficient way to do that so we can either do this uh, on paper with our matrix unfolding technique and this is very efficient this is actually also what we do um, in Dynair at second order because we have very efficient algorithms to particularly to compute um, the Hessian times the Kronecker product um, but at higher orders we are also faced with how do we get the right hand side and and here I want to mo motivate that the right hand side uh, first of all contains only lower order terms so they are readily available and the right hand side this is a very important insight is actually Fadi Bruno's formula for fxx and gxx conditional on the one thing that I don't have gxx so when I start to compute gxx I don't have it of course yet but the right hand side is if you have a look at Fadi Bruno's formula will be exactly Fadi Bruno's formula conditional on gxx being zero let me be a bit more precise so gxx go back a previous some some slides I've, I've given you the expression for gxx now what is conditional on gxx being equal to zero because I don't have it yet um, I would set so this is zero and gxx is zero okay so this whole uppercase gxx is actually zero what does this imply for zxx well zxx was gxx and uppercase gxx right here both are conditionally zero so this whole vector here would also be zero 
And what, what does this then finally imply for Fadi Bruno's formula for fxx conditional on gxx being zero? Well, this was the actual expression. And we've seen that zx, zxx is zero, so this is zero, and we are left only with fzz times zx times zx. Unfolding, we have our right hand side. And this is a very important insight that we can get right hand sides of such equations basically by computing Fadi Bruno's formula conditional on the stuff that we are looking for being zero. And once we have found gxx, we can then update fxx. And this is actually what um, our multidimensional two tensor library is very efficient in doing. So it first starts with fxx conditional to set up the right hand side, then he solves some generalized Avesta equation to get gxx or at higher orders gxxxx whatever. It's always a generalized Sylvester equation for only xxx. And once it has computed, and once it has solved the generalized Sylvester equation, it then updates Fadi Bruno's formula to also include the additional summation term right there. Okay, so let's continue. Let's go ahead and recover GUU. So for this, we would require WUU, either in tensor notation or in matrix notation, um, uppercase GUU, either in tensor or matrix notation, looking at WUUU and WU, you see that we can actually focus on the X variables here only and on the XX um, columns right here. Okay, unfolding using the Kronecker product and we have all the required ingredients to evaluate Fadi Bruno's formula FUU, either in tensors or matrix representation. So the equation, the matrix equation that I need to solve is FUU in tensors or unfolding. This is the equation I need to solve. And again, I can develop terms. Look at the previous slide, plug in all the terms and you see, uh, make use of this A matrix and you see that we end up with A times GUU equals minus a right hand side. And this right hand side only contains terms that are either given from a first order approximation or I, I have already computed GXX. So this is very important to compute GXX first because I need GXX to compute GUU. Okay, so Okay, so taking the inverse of A yields GUU. And again, if you only cons if you only want to compute the second order approximation, fine. You can stop right here, but to understand third, fourth, fifth, sixth, etc. order uh, approximations, um, let's have a closer look at the right hand side. Okay, so because in higher orders we are faced with basically the same structure of the equation to compute, for instance, G U U U U U U U for whatever order approximation. We have the same matrix A that will be multiplied to the left and some right hand side. And similar to what we just did with F X X conditional on G X X being zero, we are going to do the same thing here. So I'm claiming that the red terms right here, this is Fadi Bruno's formula for uppercase F UU conditional on GUU being zero. Okay, so containing all the terms, w but missing one, missing GUU. So let me show you that this is true. Okay, so this was the formula for GUU. That was the formula that we saw two slides ago. Now conditional on GUU being, the lowercase GUU being equal to zero. This is equal, evaluates to zero, and this is non-zero. So I end up with only those terms. What about ZUU conditional? So I had GUU 
conditional on that being zero, of course, there is a zero here. And here I am plugging in the conditional terms right here. So only that goes in here. And now Fadi Bruno's formula for FUU was this guy over here. And now I'm conditioning because I don't have it yet. I don't have GUU yet. So I can plug in my ZUU, right? This is this expression here. And you see that not the previous states, not all, but only the jumper variables. So derivatives with respect to jumper variables are relevant. So this is FY plus double star times GXX, GU, GU, GXX, GU, GU, plus the terms that are available from the first order approximation. And this is exactly, if I unfold this, this is exactly the right-hand side of that equation. And again, Dynair, Dynair's tensor library is very efficient to do this, okay? So it can compute very efficiently Fadi Bruno's formula by simply assuming that there is one term missing or simply setting it to zero. And then you get the right-hand side, you plug in the right-hand side right here, take the inverse of A, then you get GUU, and then you only update the Fadi Bruno's formula for FUU just for this one missing term. Now, what about GXU? So same steps, right, in tensors or in matrix notation. Have a look where the zeros are to simplify that and to re-express this only in G star star X U or sigma matrices. Um, there you go. And then we have all the ingredients to compute G X U. Okay, so this was the equation that we need to solve to recover G X U from. We can unfold this using Kronecker products. We can then develop terms. And if you plug in all the terms from the previous slides and make use of the definition of the perturbation matrix A, you end up with this equation. So A times GXU equals minus some right-hand side. Now, the right-hand side all obviously contains only objects that are already available from the first order approximation and previously computed GXX. So fine, simply take the inverse and you get GXU. And again, I want to show you algorithmically that the right-hand side in this equation, so it, it is more or less always a generalized Sylvester equation or this linear equation where I need to take the inverse that we need to solve. Okay, so this is true for more or less any order of approximation. And how do we get the right-hand side of those equations to make use or, or to compute the inverse here? Again, my claim is this is the conditional Fadi Brunus formula for uppercase F X U conditional on G X U being equal to zero. And let me prove that to you. So G X U was this equation right here, set G X U to zero and you end up with only that term then ZXU was this, this vector right here, conditional on that being zero. I only have the conditional GXU, plug this in. And then I can finally have a look at the conditional uppercase FXU matrix. And we see that plugging in ZXU conditional, right? Plug in that. I see that this is only for the jumper variables and I'm ending up again with FY plus times that those terms plus those terms. Unfolding, this is exactly the right-hand side that I need. Now, what about GX sigma? Okay, here there were not only uppercase FX sigma, but also FX U plus that I need to have a look at. So I would compute the partial derivatives of W with respect to X, U and plus, um, and also to with respect to X and Sigma, either in tensors or in matrix representations. Uh, the same for uppercase G. Um, 
and then I would plug in what I just computed, right? WXU plus is zero, so I can get rid of that. And so I can simplify that. And for if you have a look at WX and W plus, um, you can simplify this even further. Okay, so the same or similar steps for GX sigma. Those are a bit more involved because you have more terms in W sigma. So I think that would be good practice to go through these equations if you can derive those yourself. And then I can set up ZXU plus and ZX sigma. And finally, I have everything needed to evaluate FXU plus and FX sigma. So that was the actual equation that I need to solve. And since I'm including a moment of my stochastic innovations here, um, so whenever I mean, so ever whenever I'm multiplying with a moment, you will find that I'm going to uh, define this uh, this here with d one o one. The first index means how many x's are in this expression. There's only one. How many u's are in this expression? No. And how many u plus are in this expression? One. Okay. And the index right here corresponds actually to the last one. Okay, so this is then that term. I can unfold this and plugging all the terms in that I've computed so far, developed terms, I end up with such an equation. A times my unknown plus B times my unknown times something known equals a right, a right hand side. So this is a generalized Sylvester equation again. Okay, and the right hand side contains only objects that we've just computed or are given from lower order, from the first order. Of course, if you really have a close look here, G sigma is equal to zero due to certainty equivalence, and so is Z sigma. And if you have a look into D11, there was the first moment, uh, in which is by definition zero, so D11 is also zero. So I have um, the right hand side is equal to zero and basically I have a homogeneous generalized Sylvester equation which means GX sigma will be zero. So a second order approximation does not imply a correction for uncertainty in terms that are linear in the state vector. So I still have no, have not braked with certainty equivalence. Now Again, the algorithm to compute the right hand side is the same. So the red terms right here, the first, are the conditional Fadi Brunus formula for uppercase F GX sigma, and the blue term that contains F X U plus is actually something that I can simply compute in full. Okay, let me show you that. Now, same underlying steps, conditional on GX sigma being zero. This was the actual equation, right? Setting GX sigma here to zero and there to zero, I end up with only those terms. Um, plugging this in into ZX sigma conditionally, uh, I can plug it in. Then I can evaluate FX sigma conditionally, which would give me that equation because here's a zero, there's a zero, there's a zero, so I can focus only on Fy plus double star. Now tensor unfolding and I have one of those red terms computed. And the D101 Fxu plus times that, uh, even though I don't have to compute it, right? This is zero because sigma one is zero. I could, okay, I could, and this is important to understand that right hand expressions contain some so, some sense of Fadi Brunus formula conditional on what I'm com trying to compute, conditional on that being zero. And if I have sigma terms in there, then I'm adding something that contains moments. And I can compute those 
already in full. I don't have to do conditional stuff here. Okay, so I can compute those directly. And the same steps apply for u sigma, g u sigma. Okay, so this is just as we just saw with x sigma, um, developing terms, both in tensor notation and matrix notation. And then I'm able to evaluate Fadi Bruno's formula for f u plus and f u sigma, because those are the terms that I need to compute g u sigma. Okay, so here I'm using, since there is a moment entering here, again, d notation, so there is no x, but one u and one u plus. And this one u plus is also the index on my moment here. So unfolding, developing terms, I see that I have more or less the same equation. There is a gx sigma right here and that enters, but we already know that this is zero. Okay, so in principle, taking the inverse of A will give me G U sigma, but due to certainty equivalence and that the first moment is equal to zero, we actually see that all those terms, that is zero, we just saw that G X sigma is zero, that is zero, and Z sigma is also zero, so the whole right-hand side is equal to zero. So again, nothing regarding certainty equivalence, there is no correction for uncertainty in terms which are linear in the vector of shocks and innovations vector. Algorithmically, you can also compute the right-hand side using conditional Fadi Bruno's formula to get the red terms and the blue terms, the blue expression can be computed directly. Okay, and those are more or less the exact same steps that we just saw. So the last second order matrix so I still haven't broken with certainty equivalence, maybe now. So let's recover G sigma sigma. So let us compute those partial derivatives. Here I have to take three objects into account. So with respect to sigma twice and with respect to u plus and sigma and u plus and u plus. Uh, but those are already zero. And then, of course, I have to compute the Fadi Bruno's formula for uppercase G with respect to sigma sigma, simplifying, um, which looks a bit messy, but uh, there are many terms that uh, are the same. And with U plus sigma, simplifying, I get those expressions U plus U plus, simplifying, tensor unfolding, that's it. Now, getting the expressions for Z sigma sigma, Z U plus sigma, and Z U plus plus, those are the matrices. And finally, I'm able to compute uppercase F sigma sigma and uppercase F U plus sigma, and finally also F U plus U plus using Fadi Bruno's formula. So this is the actual equation that I need to solve. And again, I'm using, since I'm using the, the D here, there's no X, there is no U, but there are two U pluses. And also I'm adding something else. There is a E, I'm calling this E matrix for terms that, that are, that also contain the moment, but one moment less than here. And I will give you the exact formula how to compute those D and E matrix at any order in the last slides. Okay, so just for now, uh, let's call this D and this E. Um, there is some coefficient in this E matrix and uh, zero, there is no X, there is no U, um, but there is a two here, meaning that U plus and Sigma, the coefficients there add up to two. And the, the one here still corresponds to the index of U plus there. 
So tensor unfolding, all right, developing terms. Um, good practice to do that. You see that I have a plus b times g sigma. We had at first order a plus b times g sigma. Now we have a plus b times g sigma sigma equals some right hand side. And as you've already suspected, the right hand side, of course, can be computed by evaluating Fadi Bruno's formula conditional on g sigma sigma being zero. Now, let's have a closer look into, into this. Okay, so the right hand side only contains objects that I already have from the first order approximation or that are already computed. Now, I have certainty equivalence, of course, so g sigma is zero. Okay, so those terms are zero, those terms are zero, and E002, because this contains the first moment, will also be zero, but not D002. Okay, so I have A plus B times G sigma minus these terms right here, and those are non-zero. So taking the inverse of A plus B gives me G sigma sigma. So finally, the second order approximation adds a correction, a level correction for uncertainty to the approximated decision rules. Okay, so I finally uh, we've broken with certainty equivalence. Okay, and so uh, those are the algorithmic steps to show you, to motivate you that the right hand side of that equation can be computed by using condition or evaluating Fadi Bruno's formula conditionally on the stuff that is not known and the D and E matrix can be actually computed directly. Now the third order approximation. I'm gonna be brief here because the steps are very similar once you understood the underlying algorithmic steps. So the necessary and sufficient conditions stem from taking the third order um, Taylor approximation of your model equations, taking the conditional expectation, setting it to zero, and then you see that necessary and sufficient conditions require that those coefficient matrices need to be equal to zero. Okay, so for GXX, GU, GXUU, GXXU, GXX sigma, GXU sigma, GX sigma sigma, GUU sigma, G U sigma sigma G sigma sigma. Okay, so I have two, four, five, ten matrix equations for ten unknowns, which is a well-defined problem. So the actual simplified reduced form equations that we need to solve with the computer are like that. Okay, so we I have a generalized Sylvester equation to get G X X X and I can compute the right-hand side by this conditional argument. Then I would compute GUU, which is just requiring me to take the inverse of A once I have the right-hand side. The same for GXUU, the same for GXXU, um, GX sigma sigma would be a bit more complicated, um, would look like that and GXU sigma would look like that, GX sigma sigma, GUU sigma, and those would be the equations that you need to solve to get the coefficients. Now, if you do the same steps, you will see that GXX sigma will be zero, GUU sigma will be zero, and GXU sigma will be zero. So there is no correction for uncertainty in terms which are quadra quadratic in x and u. However, gx sigma sigma and gu sigma sigma will be non-zero. So there is correction in terms which are linear in x and u. So at second order we had a level correction, at third order we have a linear correction. And you can deduce that at fourth order we have a quadratic correction, etc. Now this G sigma sigma matrix, there's even there could be even more correction to the level, 
but this is only true if the third moments of your shocks are non-zero and in Dynair and in most papers we assume that shocks stem from the normal distribution so there is no correction for that. So what about the approximation at any order k? So the equations that you need to solve for say g x x x x x whatever here are always that you need to have a look at Fadi Bruno's formula for f x x x x whatever. For the cross terms of only x raised to the power of so, so x x u u u u three times u twice x the same. So only have a look at Fadi Bruno's formula for uppercase f right there. If you are interested in getting the terms for x raised to the, so some combination of x and sigmas, you would need to also include additional terms, this d and e matrix. If you also want to include x, u and sigma, you also have this d and e and the indices of these matrices differ and if you're only concerned for the G sigma sigma matrix, the, that would be the underlying necessary and su sufficient conditions. So those are the necessary and sufficient conditions for any order of approximation. Now those, there is a general formula for this D and E matrix. Um, so this is a multinomial coefficient. And uh, so basically you have to um, evaluate that, uh, but you can, compute those directly. Okay, so there is no need to do conditional stuff. And if you do k-order approximations, you have to be careful which terms you compute when. Okay, so first you need to recover the gxxxx. Then you need to start recovering for j equals 1 to k minus 1 and for i actually going down from j to 1 and you need to recover the x, u and sigma matrices. Okay, So this would be a for loop that you would run and once you have those terms and that one you're able to recover g, x, sigma or any combination thereof and once you have that you're able to recover g, u, sigma or any combination thereof and at last you would recover the g sigma 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 terms. Okay, so this is the order of computation. Now some slight computational remarks. Um, at order 2, as of Dynair 5.1, we use those unfolded matrix equations and optimized MESH code to compute Hessian times Kronecker products, um, which is faster than using the um, tensor library at second order. Now for orders greater than two, you can run the approximation, you can get the perturbation approximation for any order in Dynair. Um, we use a very specialized and optimized multi-threaded and multi-dimensional tensor library, which is implemented in C++. Um, this allows for unfolded and folded um, matrices and tensors, uh, dense and sparse representation of tensors, and it basically implements Fadi Bruno's formula very efficiently and does this conditional Fadi Bruno formula and then updating once I've computed the term very efficiently. Okay, so however, this might change in a future version because we are discussing and moving away or doing a re implementation in Fortran. And maybe we should also exploit more the tensor unfolding techniques and write optimized code for that as well. But we will see how that goes. All right, thanks for sticking through. This was not an easy lecture and there are probably some mistakes I said and maybe I also have some mistakes on my slides. Please let me know so I can update the description of the video and let everyone know um, and update corrected slides, etc. So I hope you found this useful to understand the perturbation approach in, um, in quite detail and also what how we implement this in Dynair. Have a good day. Bye.